The North American X-15 is a hypersonic rocket-powered aircraft. It was operated by the United States Air Force and NASA as part of the X-Plane series of experimental aircraft. The X-15 set unprecedented speed and altitude records in the 1960s, reaching the edge of outer space and returning with valuable data used in aircraft and spacecraft design. The X-15's highest speed, 4,520 miles per hour, was achieved on the 3rd of October, 1967, when William J. Knight flew at Mach 6.7 at an altitude of over 100,000 feet. This set the official world record for the highest speed ever recorded by a crewed powered aircraft, which remains unbroken. During the X-15 program, 12 pilots flew a combined 199 flights. Of these, eight pilots flew a combined 13 flights, which met the Air Force space flight criterion by exceeding the altitude of 50 miles, thus qualifying these pilots as being astronauts. The Air Force pilots qualified for military astronaut wings immediately, while the civilian pilots were eventually awarded NASA astronaut wings in 2005, 35 years after the last X-15 flights. The X-15 was based on a concept study from Walter Dornberger for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics for a hypersonic research aircraft. The requests for proposal, or RFPs, were published on the 30th of December 1954 for the airframe and on the 4th of February 1955 for the rocket engine. The X-15 was built by two manufacturers. North American Aviation was contracted for the airframe and Reaction Motors was contracted for building the engines. Like many X-Series aircraft, the X-15 was designed to be carried aloft and drop-launched from under the wing of the B-52 mothership. Air Force NB-52A, the high and mighty one, and NB-52B, the Challenger, served as carrier planes for all X-15 flights. Release of the X-15 from the NB-52A took place at an altitude of about 8.5 miles and a speed of about 500 miles per hour. The X-15 fuselage was long and cylindrical, with rear fairings that flattened its appearance and thick dorsal and ventral wedge fin stabilizers. Parts of the fuselage were heat-resistant nickel alloy. The retractable landing gear comprised a nose wheel carriage and two rear skids. The skids did not extend beyond the ventral fin, which required the pilot to jettison the lower fin just before landing. The lower fin was recovered by parachute. The X-15 was the product of developmental research, and changes were made to various systems over the course of the program and between different models. The X-15 was operated under several different scenarios, including attachment to a launch aircraft, drop, main engine start, and acceleration, ballistic flight into thin air space, re-entry into thicker air, unpowered glide to landing, and direct landing without a main engine start. as the X-15 also had to be controlled in an environment where there was too little air for aerodynamic flight control surfaces, it had a reaction control system, known as the RCS, that used rocket thrusters. There were two different X-15 pilot control setups. One used three joysticks and the other one joystick. The X-15 type with multiple control sticks for the pilot placed a traditional center stick between a left three-axis joystick that sent commands to the reaction control system, and a third joystick on the right used during high-G maneuvers to augment the center stick. In addition to pilot input, the X-15 Stability Augmentation System, also known as the SAS, sent inputs to the aerodynamic controls to help the pilot maintain altitude control. The reaction control system, also known as the RCS, could be operated in two modes, manual and automatic. The automatic mode used a feature called Reaction Augmentation System, RAS, that helps stabilize the vehicle at high altitude. The RAS was typically used for approximately 3 minutes when X-15 flight before automatic power off. The 
The alternative control setup used the MH-96 flight control system, which allowed one joystick in place of three and simplified pilot input. The MH-96 could automatically blend aerodynamic and rocket controls depending on how effective each system was at controlling the aircraft. Among the many controls were the rocket engine throttle and a control for jettisoning the ventral tail fin. Other features of the cockpit included heated windows to prevent icing and a forward headrest for periods of high deceleration. The X-15 had an ejection seat designed to operate at speeds of up to Mach 4. Although it was never used during the program, in the event of ejection, the seat was designed to deploy fins, which were used until it reached a safer speed slash altitude at which to deploy its main parachute. Pilots wore pressure suits, which could be pressurized with nitrogen gas. Above 35,000 feet in altitude, the cockpit was pressurized to 3.5 psi with nitrogen gas, while oxygen for breathing was fed separately to the pilot. The initial 24 powered flights used two reaction motor XLR11 liquid propellant rocket engines, enhanced to provide a total of 16,000 pounds of force, as compared to 6,000 pounds of force that a single XLR11 provided in 1947 to make the Bell X1 the first aircraft to fly faster than the speed of sound. The XLR11 used ethyl alcohol and liquid oxygen. Reaction Motors delivered the XLR-99 rocket engine, generating 57,000 pounds of force. The remaining 175 flights of the X-15 used XLR-99 engines in a single-engine configuration. The XLR-99 used anhydrous ammonia and liquid oxygen as propellant and hydrogen peroxide to drive the high-speed turbo pump that delivered propellants to the engine. It could burn 15,000 pounds of propellant in 80 seconds. Jules Bergman titled his book on the program 90 Seconds to Space to describe the total powered flight time of the aircraft. The X-15 Reaction Control System, RCS, for maneuvering in the low pressure density environment used high test peroxide, HTP, which decomposes into water and oxygen in the presence of a catalyst and could provide a specific impulse of 140 seconds. The HTP also fueled the turbo pump for the main engines and auxiliary power units, APUs. Additional tanks for helium and liquid nitrogen performed other functions. The fuselage interior was purged with helium gas and liquid nitrogen was used as coolant for various systems. The X-15 had a thick wedge tail to enable it to fly in a steady manner at hypersonic speeds. This produced a significant amount of base drag at lower speeds. The blunt end at the rear of the X-15 could produce as much drag as an entire F-104 Starfighter. Stability at hypersonic speeds was aided by side panels that could be extended from the tail to increase the overall surface area, and these panels doubled as air brakes. Altitudes attained by X-15 aircraft fell short of those of Alan Shepard's and Gus Grissom's Project Mercury space capsules in 1961, or of any other human spacecraft except the Spaceship Two space plane. However, the X-15 ranks supreme among crewed rocket-powered aircraft, becoming the world's first operational space plane in the early 1960s. Before 1958, the USAF and NACA officials discussed an orbital X-15 space plane, the X-15B, that would launch into outer space from atop an SM-64 Navajo missile. This was cancelled when NACA became NASA and adopted Project Mercury instead. By 1959, the Boeing X-20 Dinosaur space glider program was to become the USAF's preferred means for launching military crewed spacecraft into orbit. This program was cancelled in the early 1960s before an operational vehicle could be built. Various configurations of the Navajo were considered, and another proposal involving a Titan I stage. The first X-15 flight was an unpowered glide flight by Scott Crossfield on the 8th of June 1959. Crossfield also piloted the first powered flight on the 17th of September 1959, and his first flight with the XLR-99 rocket engine on the 15th of November, 1960. 
12 pilots flew the X-15. Among these were Neil Armstrong, later a NASA astronaut and the first man to set foot on the moon, and Joe Engel, later a commander of NASA space shuttle missions. In July and August 1963, pilot Joe Walker exceeded 100 kilometers in altitude, joining NASA astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts as the first human beings to cross that line on their way to outer space. The USAF awarded astronaut wings to anyone achieving an altitude of 50 miles, while the FAA set the limit of space at 100 kilometers. In the 1962 proposal, NASA considered using the B-52-X-15 as a launch platform for a Blue Scout rocket to place satellites weighing up to 150 pounds into orbit. On the 15th of November 1967, U.S. Air Force test pilot Major Michael J. Adams was killed during an X-15 flight. He entered a hypersonic spin while descending, then oscillated violently as aerodynamic forces increased after re-entry. As his aircraft flight control systems operated the control surfaces to their limits, acceleration built up beyond belief. The airframe broke apart. The second plane, X-15-2, was rebuilt after a landing accident on the 9th of November 1962, which damaged the craft and injured its pilot, John McKay. The new plane, renamed X-15-A-2, had a 28 inches fuselage extension to carry liquid hydrogen. It was lengthened by 2.4 feet and had a pair of auxiliary fuel tanks beneath its fuselage and wings, and a complete heat-resistant ablative coating was added. It took flight for the first time on the 25th of June 1964. It reached its maximum speed of 4,520 miles per hour in October 1967, with pilot William Pete Knight of the United States Air Force in control. Despite the fact that it is one of the most celebrated experimental aircraft ever flown, most historical writings have always had a rather peculiar blind spot regarding the X-15 program. The citation for the 1961 Collier Trophy, for example, noted that the vehicle had made invaluable technological contributions to the advancement of flight. It also commends the great skill and courage of its test pilots. In his letter nominating the program for the award earlier that same year, NASA Deputy Administrator Hugh L. Dryden struck the same general themes, albeit in greater detail. To the X-15 research airplane team, the scientists, engineers, technicians, and pilots of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the Department of Defense, and North American Aviation Incorporated for the conception, design, development, construction, and flight operation of the X-15 research plane, which contributed valuable research information in the supersonic and hypersonic speed regime up to the fringes of space, and to have thereby made an outstanding contribution to American leadership in aerospace science and technology, and in the operation of manned spaceflight. Certainly, all of this fame is well-deserved, considering its technical achievements as well as its contribution to knowledge about the upper atmosphere, hypersonics, high-altitude piloted flight, and so on, the X-15 clearly stands as one of the most successful research programs in the history of aviation. Similarly, the men who flew the craft into the fringes of space at six times the speed of sound proved themselves time and time again to be extraordinary individuals. These elements of the program have been recognized repeatedly, with the X-15 and its members receiving 16 awards in addition to the Collier Trophy. Very little, however, has been written about how the program was actually run, and virtually nothing has ever been recorded about its overall management. Counts begin with the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA's decision in the early 1950s to pursue development of a high-altitude research plane. Describe the technical aspects behind the selection of the contractors and then skip over to the October 1958 rollout of the first vehicle. This account of the X-15 is unfortunate for a number of reasons. To begin with, the historical literature, laudatory as it has been, actually understates the magnitude of the program's accomplishments. Technical malfunctions, delays, and cost overruns are a normal part of any cutting-edge research and development program, and those in charge of the vehicle's development and operation deserve even more credit than they have received for working around such difficulties. Their efforts are especially impressive in view of the fact that the X-15 represented the NACA's and later NASA's first efforts at managing a large-scale project. Secondly, 
Because most discussions of the X-15 have been so idealized, current United States space policy, and particularly NASA itself, have sometimes suffered by comparison. For years, observers have contrasted the cost, reliability, and performance of the X-15 with the ongoing problems of the space shuttle fleet. Since the history of the shuttle's development has been explored rather thoroughly, the extent to which such comparisons are warranted can only be determined by examining the full history of the earlier program in greater detail. Finally, a full understanding of the X-15's administrative and managerial history can provide some important insights into the problems of the United States space program. Given that practically all the vehicle is known for today is its superb design, it is hardly surprising that pilots and engineers who speak of the quote-unquote lessons learned from the X-15 experience confine themselves exclusively to technical questions. The original mission of the X-15 was to explore the phenomena associated with hypersonic flight. Three of the rocket planes were built by North American Aviation Corporation. Each was constructed out of a newly developed nickel alloy known as Inconel X and measured 15 meters long with a wingspan of nearly 7 meters. Missions took place within the specially constructed high test range, an aerodynamic corridor that stretched 780 kilometers from Utah across the Nevada and California deserts all the way to Edwards Air Force Base. Complete with radar tracking stations and emergency landing sites, during a typical mission, the X-15 vehicle was carried to an altitude of 14 kilometers by a modified B-52, of which two were built and released. The single pilot would ignite the XLR-99 engine, which would burn for approximately 90 seconds, accelerating to an average speed of Mach 5 after flying a parabolic trajectory into the upper atmosphere. The pilot would bring the craft in for a glide landing on the Rogers Dry Lake bed at Edwards. By early 1954, the agency had identified four technical areas of concern. The materials and structures needed to resist the high temperatures of re-entry, a better understanding of aerodynamics operating at hypersonic speeds, systems to maintain vehicle stability and control, and the ability of pilots to work effectively in space environment. The NACA's Langley Aeronautical Laboratory, Ames Aeronautical Laboratory, and the High Speed Flight Station began studying the feasibility of developing a research airplane capable of exploring these critical issues. By the middle of the year, NACA engineers had settled upon the basic design configurations for a craft capable of speeds up to 6,600 feet per second. Mach 6, at an altitude in excess of 250,000 feet. The agency quickly realized that developing such a plane would be too large and expensive an undertaking for NACA alone. Accordingly, in July 1954, officials met with representatives of the Air Force and the Navy, both of which were considering developing similar vehicles and saw NACA's proposal as a reasonable compromise. Thus. In December of 1954, representatives from NACA, the Air Force, and the Navy signed a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, for the development and testing of a winged hypersonic vehicle. The MOU called for NACA to have technical control over the project, and for the Air Force and Navy to fund the design and construction phases under Air Force supervision. After contractor testing was completed, the vehicle would be turned over to NACA, which would conduct the actual flight tests. The Navy was in charge of the simulation and training portions of the program. An interagency body, the Research Airplane Committee, known by participants as the X-15 Committee, consisting of representatives from each of the sponsoring organizations, was formally in charge of supervising the project, although it appears to have played a largely symbolic role. On January 17th of 1955, the plane was officially designated the X-15. The Air Force sent out invitation to bid letters to 12 prospective contractors. On December 30th, 1954, a bidder's conference was held at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. On January 18th, 1955, proposals were received from four companies. By August, the Air Force's Wright Air Development Center and NACA had concluded the North American Aviation's proposal had the greatest merit. Negotiations with North American were stalled. Project managers agreed to extend the program from 30 to 38 months, and in November, following price negotiations, the Air Material Command Director of Procurement and Production issued the formal contract letter to North American for the development and construction of three X-15 aircraft. Separate invitations to bid were issued to four potential engine contractors in 1955, and the final contract for the X-15 engine, the XLR-99, was issued to Reaction Motors on September 7, 1956. 
By mid-1958, when it became clear that the XLR-99 would not be ready in time for the first round of test flights, Air Force project managers directed that two smaller XLR-11 engines, also built by reaction motors, be used for the initial tests. Construction on the first X-15 began in September 1957. It was delivered, without the XLR-99 engine, to the Flight Test Center at Edwards on October 17, 1958. The legendary Scott Crossfield, an engineering test pilot for North American, who had earlier been a Navy pilot and NACA research engineer, flew the contractor demonstration flights, including the first captive flight on March 10, 1959, the first glide flight on June 8, and the first powered flight with the XLR-11 engines on September 17. The first government mission with NASA pilot Joseph A. Walker took place on March 25, 1960. Crossfield made the first test flight with the XLR-99 engine on November 15, 1960. By the end of 1961, the X-15 had achieved its design goal of Mach 6 and had achieved altitudes in excess of 200,000 feet. On August 22, 1963, Walker achieved an altitude record for piloted aircraft, taking the X-15 to 354,000 feet, more than 67 miles. On October 3, 1967, Captain William J. Pete Knight set a world speed record of 4,520 miles per hour, Mach 6.7, which would stand until the first mission of the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1981. In March 1962, the X-15 Committee approved an X-15 follow-on program, a series of flights in which the vehicle was converted into a testbed for use in a variety of scientific observations and technological development projects. These flights produced a wealth of scientific information in such areas as space science, solar spectrum measurements, micrometeorite research, ultraviolet stellar photography, atmospheric density measurements, high altitude mapping, and others. The final flight of the X-15 program, the 199th, took place on October 24, 1968. Most of those involved with the project had expected that work with the X-15 would lead directly to an even more ambitious aircraft. The X-20, or Dinosaur, short for Dynamic Soaring Vehicle, which would actually fly to and from Earth orbit. That project, however, was cancelled in the 1960s, it would not be until the Space Shuttle program that NASA would turn to the use of weighed vehicles for pilot and space flight. The Navy's portion of the program, pilot training, marked the first extensive use of motion simulators, such as its human centrifuge at the Naval Air Development Center in Johnsdow, Pennsylvania. Given the magnitude of its objectives, as well as the vehicle's sheer complexity, the total development time of five years from project approval to first powered flight and two years from construction start is really quite impressive. The estimated cost of the program appears similarly modest, particularly when compared to space-related projects that followed. The program's total cost, including development and eight years of operations, are usually estimated at $300 million in 1969 dollars, that is. Each flight is estimated to have costed roughly $600,000. Using all three aircraft, NASA was able to fly an average of four missions per month. More important, the program had an exceptionally low casualty rate. In November 1962, the landing gear on craft number two collapsed, flipping the vehicle over on its back and injuring pilot Jack McKay, who recovered and was able to fly the X-15 again. On November 15, 1967, pilot Mike Adams was killed in a crash that destroyed craft number three. These tragedies notwithstanding, for nearly 200 missions in high-performance aircraft operating at the fastest speeds ever attained in a region of the upper atmosphere about which little was known, the X-15's record for safety and reliability was really quite extraordinary. Indeed, the most common reason for mission delays and aborts was weather, which had to be clear along the entire high-test corridor. Finally, the program captured the popular imagination at a time when many Americans and much of the world believed that the United States had fallen behind in the space race with the Soviet Union. Public interest and media coverage of the initial flights was quite high, although it dissipated quickly after the beginning of the Project Mercury. Nevertheless, the success of the X-15 provided the first tangible evidence to the country after Sputnik and Vanguard that American science and technology were on par with that of the Soviet Union. Even tinder ideal conditions, 
A successful R&D program of the scope of the X-15 represents an extraordinary managerial challenge. In addition to the sheer complexity of the technology, project officials had to overcome a number of unique administrative difficulties. As already noted, this was NASA's first foray into full-scale project management. As a program, the X-15 involved far more than development and flying of the aircraft itself. The X-15 was never forced through in-depth hearings before congressional committees or protracted negotiations with the Bureau of the Budget, as it was then known, let alone subjected to outside scrutiny each year of its existence. Although responsibility for the project was spread across a number of government agencies and private firms, these actors, the military, the NACA, the NASA, and the aerospace contractors represented a fairly uniform set of concerns. All wished to build a high-altitude hypersonic experimental aircraft, and there was a substantial agreement on what specific design and performance criteria the vehicle was to meet. This ensured that the major design decisions on the project would be made primarily according to technical rather than political or economic considerations. This is most cleverly evident with regard to the question of the program's original cost estimates and time frame. It is seldom acknowledged in the historical literature, but the X-15 program was a victim of what has become a fairly common occurrence in the US space program, namely substantial delays and overruns. $300 million does seem small in comparison to the cost of, say, Apollo or the shuttle, but it is still seven times the original estimate of $42 million. The final development cost of the engine alone were more than $68 million, plus a $6 million fee to reaction motors, a tenfold increase over what was expected when the project began. In addition, the complete vehicle, including the large engine, was ready for flight more than two years behind schedule. Despite all of this, development during the 1955 to 1957 period was never held up by a lack of funds, although in some years needed funding did not come through until the last minute. After the launch of the Sputnik 1 in 1957, interest in the project on the part of the military, political leaders, and public at large grew rapidly. As already noted, media coverage of the first flights was the most intense ever seen at Edwards, and even led to some public reaction mix-ups between NASA and the Air Force. Once the first Mercury flights got underway, public attention shifted to events at Cape Canaveral. This might, however, have ultimately worked to the program's benefit. A major contributor to the X-15's success over the long run was its emphasis on incremental development and its use in highly specialized scientific and technical research. As experienced with many later space projects, including Apollo after Apollo 11, the shuttle, etc., has shown the general public tends to lose interest it appears as though the X-15 got a needed boost to public fanfare at precisely the right point in its history. The later development and early flight test usage, and then became regarded as a low-key effort worthy of only occasional interest, just as it was entering its less quote-unquote flashy research phase. These shifts in external perception probably could not have been planned any better. As seen repeatedly in the case of the XLR-99, as well as in actual flight operations, project officials from both the Air Force and NASA were never hesitant to point out, and more importantly, work to correct potential or actual technical flaws even when this resulted in increased costs. Recently, critics of the shuttle program have accused NASA of ignoring or even covering up such problems for fear of the political ramifications. Conventional wisdom holds that a joint project ought to have each participant's roles clearly articulated. One of the more striking features of the X-15 MOU, however, is that the division of responsibility for the craft's design, e.g. that NACA had quote-unquote technical control under the Air Force's quote-unquote supervision, does not seem to be all that well spelled out. Such ambiguity is almost always a potential source of trouble for any joint project, particularly in view of the fact that the Air Force was providing the bulk of the program's funding. As was noted earlier, the Interagency X-15 Committee was formally in charge of the project, but it does not appear that this body had much involvement in day-to-day -day decision making or in settling disputes among the participants. One observer has described its role as that of offering high-level sanction to lower-level decisions. There were exceptions. On one occasion, when the Air Force had started a protest over building the high test range only to hand it over to NACA, like the X-15 aircraft itself, the committee's endorsement of the original agreement served to end the dispute. For most other areas of potential conflict, however, there is no evidence that the X-15 committee ever played any substantive role. 
The situation was further complicated by the fact that responsibility for the development and manufacturing of the X-15 systems was spread across an exceedingly large number of contractors and subcontractors. These included not only North American Aviation and Reaction Motors, but also General Electric, which was responsible for the auxiliary power units, David Clark Company, developer of the pressurization suit, and International Nickel Company, creator of the Incano X nickel alloy for the fuselage, Bell Aircraft, supplier of the ballistic control rockets, Sperry Gyroscope, developer of the in-flight electronic indicator systems, and many, many others. In all, more than 300 private firms participated in the project. Fortunately and surprisingly, the internal conflicts that did occur were minor and appear to have had no impact on the program overall. Early in the design process, for example, the NACA's request for a modification to allow for testing different types of leading edges was rejected by the Air Force. In late 1955, during the negotiations with Reaction Motors, the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics made a bid to take over responsibility for the development of the XLR-99. The Navy based this claim on the fact that it had been working with Reaction Motors for the three past years developing the XLR-30 rocket engine, the design of which was to serve as the basis of the X-15 power plant. The Air Force rejected the argument, citing somewhat ironically the need to keep management responsibility within a single agency. Finally, as already noted, in 1955, the Air Force sought to retain control over the high test range. One area of conflict once again between the Air Force and NACA did prove to be rather serious, but in some respects may have actually been somewhat beneficial. The problem involved the development of the XLR-99 which proved to be the most serious technical and administrative obstacle in the entire program. The NACA had already complained to the Air Force in late 1955 that the procurement process for the engine was taking too long, prompting the latter to write a letter of reassurance. Then, in April 1956, a representative of the Lewis Laboratory, who had revisited the Reaction Motors facility, reported the company's efforts on the engine to be quote-unquote inadequate on several fronts. He felt the development program was already behind schedule and that some of its estimates were too optimistic, by as much as a year. Although it is not clear what immediate impact the report had on the Air Force project managers, subsequent events were to bear out the NACA's concerns. In August 1956, an Air Force representative noted in a letter to Reaction Motors that a test of the engine's thrust chamber, which had been scheduled for April, had not taken place yet. By early 1957, North American had begun to complain about the pace of the engine development. The prime contractor found that not only was the program four months behind schedule, but that the weight of the entire engine was increasing while its projected performance appeared to be declining. The difficulties arising from divided authority can be illustrated by the responses to North American's criticisms. In February 1957, two sets of meetings were held between Reaction Motors personnel and representatives of the Air Force and the NACA and North American. For its part, the Air Force appeared to come out of its meeting assured that every effort would be expended to prevent further engine scheduled slippages. To the extent that this claim has any validity, the larger question it raises is whether NASA officials are simply more timid now than they were 40 years ago, or whether the prevailing political and economic climate creates conditions more conducive to error detection and recovery. This is a particularly important point since the claims of some critics of current U.S. space policy notwithstanding one of the more interesting aspects of the X-15 program is that far from being substantially different from later NASA enterprises, it is in many respects a familiar story. Rampant cost increases, serious delays, technical failures, and even loss of life. To be sure, the management of the X-15 was superb, particularly given the difficulty of its mission. There was some degree of infighting which usually was settled quickly. As expected on a project of this nature, technical difficulties arose, necessitating design compromises, additional costs, and schedule slippages. Because the program was surrounded by a supportive political and economic environment, however, NASA officials and their counterparts in the Air Force were able to face these problems squarely and develop solutions, some of them quite innovative. Nevertheless, given all of the controversy besetting the present U.S. space program, it is today a cause for wonder that an undertaking that had as many serious problems as the X-15 was not only tolerated at the time, but is now touted as one of the great aerial space success stories. In this context, perhaps even more now than then, the X-15 deserved the Collier Trophy as the program for the most outstanding aerial space achievement of its time.
If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.